welcome to all joining the So You Want to Be a Surgeon event during our Charter Week, which celebrates the foundation of RCSI by Royal Charter of King George II in 1784. This is a new event brought to you by the Fellows and Members Office and is directed towards those interested in pursuing a career in surgery, medical students, interns, foundation year doctors, and those of you embarking on a surgical training program. I particularly welcome our RCSI affiliate members and encourage all of you who have not done so to consider applying for membership. RCSI wants to support you in your decision and in your journey. And as you take your first steps on the pathway to surgery, I encourage you to take this opportunity to learn from those who've gone before. What inspired them? What helped them to get where they are today? And how they try to mentor the next generation of surgeons? Having made that journey myself, I know how important it is to listen to good people, to take advice from those you admire, and to ground yourself by keeping family and friends close by. I know that you will find this event both informative and inspirational. I'm delighted to introduce Kevin Barry, RCSI Director of National Surgical Training, who will lead a conversation with surgical trainees in their various stages of their training, and with RCSI fellows working in a variety of surgical specialties. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you, President, and I'm delighted to welcome the speakers today for our first session, Reflections on a Surgical Pathway, the Trainee Perspective. Connor Sheehan, third year medical student, Vice President of the RCSI Surgical Society, Ms. Megan Powerfoley, Vascular Surgery Trainee, Mr. Billy Lane O'Neill, Plastics and Reconstructive Surgery Trainee at Beaumont Hospital Dublin, Mr. Khaled Munir, ENT Surgical Trainee, Dr. Barbara Julius, General Surgery SPR, and Dr. Sami Ab El Dawab, who's a general surgical trainee currently carrying out pediatric surgical training at Crumlin Hospital in Dublin. Firstly, thank you all for coming together today to talk with me about various aspects of surgery and surgical training. Your group is representative of the future of surgery, and we all know how important it is that we listen very carefully to what our trainees are up to these days, and we want to particularly know if you're happy with your surgical training and the direction of your careers. Sammy, you're coming towards the end of your surgical training. You're in your final year of surgical training as an SPR in general surgery. When you look back at your surgical training from the time that you started as a core surgical trainee, could you give me some reflections on your surgical training, what you felt were the strengths of the program, and potentially, were there any weaknesses in your training? Uh, thank you very much, Prof, for the invite. As you said, Sammy is my name. I'm one of uh, the general surgical trainees. I'm an SDA, so the final year of my training. Um, I started the training uh, back in 2016, the HSC. I started my BSC through the old system, and now it has moved on to the run through program. And during my training, I think one of the things that's come across is the mentorship and what I like to refer to as the surgical huddle. Um, uh, in surgery, which I am not sure if uh, the other specialties have, there is this togetherness sensation in the surgical specialty. You have a lot of mentors, you have a lot of colleagues, and you have a lot of uh, friends, let's call it, that kind of guide you and help you through the training. And one of the strengths is that there is a lot of people around you who can guide you, tell you what to do, give you advice, and direct you the right way. And I think that was essential to my training. Uh, I got a lot of very good advice from a lot of people and that kind of helped me to get here. Uh, the college was very essential as well. Uh, it had an open communication. I came in through the training program, like I said, transitioned from the old scheme to the new scheme. And the college always provided uh, insight, input and advice on how to do, how to deal with all of this. Uh, I kept my engagement with all of them. And for fairness, uh, all my trainers were very, very open and, and, and very, um, very essential to, to advise and how to progress with all of this and how to kind of navigate all these changes at that time. Um, 
I had a lot of, of teaching sessions. Uh, we moved on from the old WBA scheme and the paperwork to the new ISCP system for assessment and continual assessment. And again, the college was and the trainers were essential and advised on how to transition and how to kind of get started with all of this because we didn't know it was very new at the time and now we're using it freely. Uh, and at the last, uh, all during my training, there was a lot of changes every two or three years, there was new changes, but I always felt secure, I always felt able to deal with them, and I always had people around me to advise and guide me through this. So I maintain good communication with all of them. I think mentorship is key in the in the surgical practice. Um, and I think that's one of the that one of the most uh, or the if not the most important strengths in the training scheme. Yes, Sammy, I agree with you absolutely. Mentorship is extremely important and you've highlighted that throughout our conversation. Would you have any suggestions for how we might improve our training programs, for example? Uh, I think uh, training programs and trainers are uh, in a continuous process of development and that come across to the trainees as different changes throughout. And I always say to my colleagues and juniors is since I started the surgical training, every year there was some sort of a change to the training scheme. So when I started, it was the old system BST. For a couple of years, there was the BSPT, and then we moved on to the run-through programs. The IECP came in, and now the uh, the new curriculum is coming in. I think maintaining communication with the RCSI is very, very important, and kind of anticipating these changes in advance, I think, will help the trainees a lot. So, for example, if we knew a few years in advance that the new curriculum is coming in. Or this is and, with, and this this has happened. We we knew in a few in, in in two years time that there is a new curriculum coming in, but we didn't know what exactly it was. So, training sessions or communication sessions with the trainees, trainees' perspective on these changes, what it means to them, what impact is going to have to them beforehand, I think will help uh, a lot. Will alleviate some of the anxiety that trainees have. What does this mean to them, and how they can approach it and tackle it is, I think, it will be very helpful to them. Thank you for expressing those ideas, Sammy. And Connor, from your perspective as a medical student, what year in medical school are you at right now? I'm a third year out of five. Okay. And listening to Sammy, who is coming to the end of his surgical training, why might you or any of your classmates be inspired to consider a career in surgery? What is it about surgery that would potentially attract somebody like yourself, for example, to consider a career in surgery? Yeah, so it's definitely an interesting question. And I suppose speaking from the perspective of being a student in RCSI, we're exposed to surgery a little bit earlier on, kind of uh, inadvertently. So our anatomy dissections are led by retired surgeons. Um, so, you know, whether we're conscious of it or subconscious, you know, we're hearing stories about what it was like to be in theater from these surgeons. We're hearing about anatomy being practically applied to the actual field of, of surgery. So it's definitely interesting to get that perspective so early on. Um, you know, speaking for myself, I've had a long standing uh, interest in surgery following a transition year work experience. And now that I'm in medical school, um, my interest has been narrowed down to plastic and reconstructive surgery. And I would directly attribute this to the speaker events held by the surgical society in the university. Um, and during my time on clinical rotations. So the speaker events are brilliant because we get to hear from consultants and trainees, and they give us insights into what it's actually like uh, to be in the specialty. But for me, it was the clinical rotation that I've only started this year as a third year that kind of really set me on the path uh, down looking at a career in surgery. Um, so during my rotation, the team that I was based with, they got me involved. They made me feel welcome. And they encouraged me to be hands on. And, you know, really in hindsight, a few months have passed since this, but it had a huge impact on forming the foundation for the confidence that I now have when I go into theater. And, you know, more than the teaching and the encouragement that I was given, you know, it was seeing someone a bit further up the same mountain that I want to climb, telling me that I can do it too. So I think it is this early encouragement and positive experience that, you know, it really does set students, you know, to want to go down the path of surgery um, and to commit to this, you know, career. 
So obviously then your career aspirations and your choice of surgery as a career is something that you've been thinking about quite seriously for some time. Are you familiar with the process of how a medical student would subsequently apply for surgical training with the RCSI? Yeah, so, you know, as you mentioned, I am interested in surgery and it's something that I've thought about for quite a while. So, you know, I've tried to, you know, get as much advice out of every SHO who's willing to chat to me about it or registrar, uh, you know, between um, patients in clinic and to try and get advice about it. But, you know, from the perspective of a student, we don't really receive much information on how to get onto core surgical training and how to progress up to become an ST3 and, and to make it down, you know, the road towards fellowship and consultant. So I think that the student run surgical society, which most universities in uh, Ireland have, I think that's the best route to try and, you know, get this information out. You know, there's certainly no shortage of students who are interested in surgery, particularly I know in RCSI just this past Saturday, we had the internal skills competition where we had 40 students uh, out of our 700 plus members come in on a Saturday morning to practice basic surgical skills um, to, you know, progress forward to represent their universities at the intercollegiate skills competition. So, you know, I think the audience is certainly there. And I think if you were to contact the student run surgical societies, they'd be more than happy to facilitate, you know, information evenings um, to hear from trainees and consultants and from program directors. Barbara, if I can focus on your training to date, can you give me some insights into why you chose surgery and how you entered a specialty training program in general surgery? Yeah, so similar enough to Connor, like I decided I wanted to be a surgeon when I was a medical student. So I went on an Erasmus exchange to Germany and I ended up doing hepatobiliary surgery. And again, I was, the team were very good. They got me involved. I was scrubbing in for Whipple's procedures. I was assisting, I was closing skin. Uh, and the, the consultant was constantly teaching me and trying to get me doing more. And then I suppose after that, I came back to Ireland and I knew I wanted to do surgery. So I had a lot of people that inspired me even in Galway. So Professor Karen, for example, he's a really passionate surgeon. He's great for teaching. And then I went on to do my intern year in St. Vincent's Hospital. And then I went on again and did hepatobiliary surgery because I developed an interest in it as a student. And then again, I met a lot of really passionate, inspiring surgeons. So all of the consultants there were great. And I was involved in theatre again. And I had an SVR at the time, Fiona Hand, who was really good and really good for mentoring and giving me advice on how to apply for the scheme, but also gave me advice on things like how to become competitive in my application and so from an early stage she kind of was telling me what I should be doing, what courses to attend, uh, what type of research and things to be involved in to make sure that my application was very as competitive as it could be. So then by the time the applications rolled around I kind of felt like I was already prepared and I knew what to do. Um, and then so I started my basic specialty training in the Matter Hospital. So again I did hepatobiliary surgery and some cardiothoracics as well but by the time it came to choosing specialty I knew general surgery was what I wanted to do. I had loads of exposure in it. I thought the pathologies were great. It's a very varied pathologies that we meet and we have a very diverse patient group that we work with and we deal with a lot of um, short-term conditions conditions that you can manage and then the patient is fine after two days but then also you're dealing with long-term conditions as well so I really enjoyed the job satisfaction of it so when the time came to choose I kind of knew I wanted to be a general surgeon so that was kind of easy enough and then just continuing to be as competitive as I could be for applying for, for the higher specialty training scheme. And then you joined the higher surgical training scheme in general surgery in July of 2021. Yeah. And if I'm correct you're working as an S33 general surgical trainee at the University Hospital in Limerick. Yeah. So how is that going for you at the present time? Are you happy that you've entered the higher surgical training program in general surgery? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I love it. And um, like I love. So, for example, I'm doing breast surgery at the moment, but obviously it's still through general surgery. So. One day I'll be doing a breast clinic, then the next day I could be doing breast theatre, and then the next day I might be doing endoscopy with one of the colorectal surgeons, and then I might be doing some minor ops as well, and then I might be in the emergency theatre on the Friday. So even though I'm in a breast job, it's still very general and it's still very varied, and you're picking up a very wide range of skills and knowledge as well, which I love. Uh, and in no two days are the same. 
when you're on call, like you don't know what's going to come in. You can't be like, oh, I know I'm going to get three of whatever. You honestly don't know. And I love that because you have to have such a wide knowledge base as well. And you always have to be on your toes. You have to stay up to date in the various subspecialties as well. So you need to know what's happening in colorectal. You need to know what's happening in upper GI as well. And you need to be up to date with your guidelines. So, yeah, I'm very happy. I do in general. You also mentioned the importance, Barbara, as Sammy did, of mentorship. And so did Connor as a medical student. So why do you think mentorship is important in surgical training? Yeah, that's a great question. I suppose like for me, like I came from a family where there was no medics in my family. And I, like Connor was saying, like I had no idea how a medical student becomes a surgeon in Ireland. You know, I had no idea what the path I was. But even so, to have people that are a bit ahead of you, that are inspiring you, and that actually just tell you what ways to go and can kind of give you advice on things. Because uh, obviously there's loads of stuff on the internet, but it's great to have someone that's like, oh, well, you could do this. I know if you do this course, it'll really help you. Or if you go and work in this job, it'll really help you because I know that this is your goal. So it's always great to have someone that gives you advice on things. And the good thing about mentorship is that it's very personalized because obviously everyone's different and we all have different interests and different personalities as well. So it's very good to have someone that knows you that can kind of give you advice as well. And I think it's really important as we all progress, like even Connor, that we're always um, giving back as well and that we're always looking after those who are coming behind us that we make sure that we never forget that none of us would have got where we were if there wasn't someone ahead. So always remember to do that for others as well. So you're generally nice to the medical students then, Barbara? <laughs> I am, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's good to hear because the medical students, as Connor said, they are the next group of people to enter surgical training. Megan, can I ask you to explain maybe in a little bit more detail about someone who would develop a competitive portfolio to apply for surgical training. Absolutely. I think um, Barbara's uh, story of getting advice from senior colleagues early on is something I didn't do. And definitely retrospectively, when I get caught, people, when people ask me for advice on getting onto the BST or the HST, I say, sit down with the marketing scheme, see where the points are and try and make sure that you've ticked it, like one box in, in, in multiple spheres. So for medical students, what you're looking at is making sure that you've got some kind of research. You don't have to have a PhD, but any kind of student project you, that you get given, try to take it that one step further. Try get a poster out of it. Try get a presentation, and never be afraid to ask, you know, a supervisor for assistance with that. Um, sometimes opportunities will fall into your lap to get involved in a research project. Grab them. That's what happened to me when I was a student. So when it came around to um, applying for my BST, um, I was very luckily a second author on a paper and I had gotten a couple of um, presentations out of the intercalated masters I did in Trinity. Um, I hadn't, like Barbara, kind of set out to make myself very competitive. I kind of just fell into it. Um, but when it came right to the HST, um, I took a more um, focused approach to it. So I suppose research is one sphere. Definitely look at teaching, because um, I think teaching personally, on a personal level, it's really rewarding, um, you know, w when you can kind of teach the medical students, teach your interns, teach your SHOs, and you start to see that spark of interest in people. So as a medical student, try to get involved in it early on. Sometimes there are, you know, mentorship project programs to teach some of the earlier years. When you're an intern, definitely get involved in intern-led tutorials um, for the medical students. And when you're an SHO, you can get involved in intern teaching or student teaching. And some universities now, they offer, I suppose, more formal um, kind of junior lectureship roles or, or, or tutor roles are great ones when you kind of need a, a year to build your CV, you want a little bit of a break and you get to formally experience kind of medical education. And um, so clinical research, teaching and the other, I suppose, big aspect to make yourself competitive is clinical experience. Um, and as a medical student, you can gather that by doing dedicated electives. You know, if you find an area of surgery that you think sounds really interesting, um, make contact with the, one of your local teams and try getting an elective in it. Um, you know, because when it comes to interview, you can really show that you're dedicated and that you're interested. Um, and then one thing that I didn't do as well, that I do think retrospectively would be very helpful, is um, for people coming out of intern year and they think they want to do surgery, but they're not quite sure, um, do a standalone year in a job that you think would be very interesting. I'm in Galway at the minute and they offer a great foundation program, which gives students, or which gives SHOs, I should say, um, a taste of... of up to four different surge and um, like types of surgery, um, which I think can be very, very helpful to them, especially because with our BST, you could end up doing 18 months of the same specialty, which is what I did. Now, I was 
gung-ho for vascular. I knew what I wanted to do. Um, but for somebody who really likes kind of surgery in general, but hasn't been exposed to a lot of different specialties, taking a year to get some, to get some experience, to kind of make that step up from intern to SHO, to get experience of what it's like being on call, making decisions, being in theatre, learning how to scrub, learning how to tie a knot. You know, they're all great things to have at that. When you get onto your BSc, you can really hit the ground running, you know, when you can start to impress and you can start to fill up your logbook. And it gives you a bit of breathing room because two years is a lot of time to get all of your exams, all of these research presentations, go to all of these conferences, do all of these courses. Um, and I sometimes think that we feel we're under pressure to get it all done in as little time as possible. But I'm in my second SPR year now, and I can definitely say, you know, for me, it's no longer a sprint to the finish. You know, all the experience that you can get is is really, really valuable because when it's your name over the bed looking after the patient, that's what you're going to fall back on, the experience that you've gathered over the years. Um, through you know your peers, through your consultants, um, and I suppose through your juniors as well. Um, so experience, experience, experience is, is a real way to, I suppose, to, to bolster yourself. And it gives you the confidence to really sell your CV as well then. Um, all the other bits will fall into place. Megan, that's really an excellent summary of advice and it's very concise and it's obviously something that you've thought about in significant detail. So you're working as an SPR in vascular surgery at the present time. Can I ask you, what motivated you to go into vascular surgery? Um, it was a bit of a happy accident. Uh, when I was a medical student, unlike uh, I suppose Connor and Barbara, I wanted to do emergency medicine at the start. I was like super excited. Everything's immediate. It's right in front of you. Um, so I went off and I did an elective in emergency medicine and I realised about you know, 85% of it is the high octane stuff and a lot of the rest of it is more more low level, but nonetheless important stuff, but that really didn't grab my attention. Um, and then I wanted to do obstetrics, probably because I was inspired by Grey's Anatomy and not um, actual obstetrics, but I did have some very, very um, inspirational kind of female role models in the obstetric field. And then I just did a two week like college organized, like mandatory um, surgical placement in Tala in vascular. And I just loved it. Like it just clicked for me for the first time I was going home after placement being like, well, I want to read about this. You know, I want to learn more about that. Um, and I suppose um, compared to other specialties, like this was kind of the first time I really clicked my head into maybe I want to be a surgeon. Um, so I went off and I made sure that my intern um, rotations had a vascular placement in it. I did vascular in the matter. Um, I think doing an intern job, while it won't give you much exposure to um, the surgical aspect of your chosen specialty, it does give you a really good flavour for the pre and post-op care and what your cohort of patients is like, um, which I think some people, they really like the technical aspect of vascular, but they find the patient cohort can be a bit challenging and a bit demoralising at times. Um, so, but I didn't mind it. And then I made sure that my uh, my CST1 uh, rotation included vascular um, to really kind of familiarise myself with the actual surgical aspects of it. Um, and I loved it. I love that it's a mix of endovascular and open. Um, I find it, you know, it's, it's every surgery that you approach is unique. Every patient's anatomy is unique. Um, there's a huge amount of kind of complex decision making to it and um, it's very challenging at times it can be heartbreaking at times it's really rewarding and um, I like that there's um, a, a really good mix of elective and then there's some you know good old emergencies to um, to really challenge yourself and, and, and really try and make sure that you get your patient a good outcome. Um, I like that we're constantly kind of evolving new endovascular techniques but um, we still have that kind of old school open surgery to fall back on. I love that we operate pretty much everywhere, you know, and um, that on your elective list, you might have a lower limb revascularization, you might have an EVAR, you might have a carotid, um, you might have some kind of open abdominal surgery um, with trauma. You never really know what you might have to do. Um, I think there's a huge scope in vascular for, for subspecialization. We're really a specialty coming into our own. Um, and I like that it's really collaborative as well. You do a lot of working with lots of other specialties, um, both medical and surgical, and our colleagues in interventional radiology. So there's a huge... Um, I suppose like Barbara was saying what, what appeals to her about general surgery, that there's a big, um, a really wide variety of what's available for you and you can just immerse yourself in it and you'll definitely find something that's your particular niche. So teamwork, you would regard that as central to surgical practice? 
I think it's central to any kind of job satisfaction. It, it's very difficult to shoulder all this responsibility on your own. And I, I think it's definitely one of the advantages of surgery, um, maybe compared to other specialties, that we do have this really good cohesive team. And it very much feels like you, the SHOs, the intern, the consultant, and we all band together. And I like that we tend to be kind of small and quite tight knit, but there's also this huge kind of wider and um, multi multidisciplinary team um, backing you up. I think you really get to know your colleagues when you're on a surgical rotation. Um, you know, and uh, you really get to trust them. They really support you. And I think that kind of close networking really fosters these, these important mentorships um, that, that we've already talked about and how important it is to have somebody who takes an interest in you. Um, and I think that that kind of close knit team that you get in surgery really helps foster those relationships. Sounds to me like you're working in the right area. You seem incredibly enthusiastic for the specialty of vascular surgery. Um, I think the most important thing for medical students is um, find a job that you love, you know, because you know, it's, it's, it's not all roses. It can be very challenging at times. You know, you can work in really high pressure situations. Um, it can be very difficult when, you know, you invest a huge amount of, of time and energy and I suppose an, an emotional energy into really helping your patients and you don't get the outcomes that you want. Um, so I suppose make sure that when you do pick your job, that it's something that's going to get you out of bed in the morning, that it's something that you're going to enjoy, that you're going to be happy doing it for 40 years. So that even when you do have the bad days, the good days outweigh them. Um, you know, I can think it'd be difficult. It can You can easily get yourself into this trap of, of oh, well, I've dedicated so much time and effort into becoming this particular thing. Um, make sure you still enjoy it, you know. All very useful comments. Connor, I'm sure you're listening to everything that Megan has said. What would be your reaction, Connor, to some of the things that Megan has outlined over the last couple of minutes? Um, well, you know, I think the point about finding a mentor and someone, especially she kind of alluded to it, was that someone who's enthusiastic about their specialty, it is really infectious. And when you're a medical student and everything is new, and exciting, particularly if you're a little bit interested in surgery already, when you find someone who is, you know, interested and passionate about it, it, it really does rub off on you. Um, and that's certainly been my experience uh, on during my rotations, you know, and I think the other thing, and Barbara kind of alluded to it as well, is, is um, you know, having a specialty with a variety of cases, you know, it keeps things a bit more interesting and different and you know when you combine that with the way that medicine's going where there's constant um innovations and i think surgery in particular as a field is kind of built on innovations uh so i think seeing that and hearing all of that you know it's hard not to be excited about a career in surgery but i suppose it is always important to pick something that'll get you out of bed in the morning because you know there will be challenging days, but I think, again, and um, Sammy mentioned this about the idea of the, the huddle and the team, you know, having that support system around you, that's something that I want to be involved with from hearing that. And I know that um, with the surgical society that I work with now, um, you know, it is a team effort and we all support each other. And, you know, for me, that's that's definitely a big draw to surgery is that it does have that real team element of, you know, everyone works together and everyone has their role inside the team. And then you have the MDT approach outside of that as well. Thank you very much, Connor. Billy, if I could maybe ask you to give us some insights into why you chose plastic and reconstructive surgery for your higher surgical training program. Um, it was quite funny listening to Connor actually at the beginning because I actually, the Irish Surgical Training Group have a series of videos uh, which state on why people chose the career they did. And I'm pretty sure that Connor um, has more or less paraphrased kind of nothing you did, but I got into it for the exact same reasons he did. Um, they were actually nice to me. Um, so it's funny, um, when I started off doing medicine, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to do maybe something like cardiology or gastroenterology because I thought, oh, it's something you get to do with your hands. I never once considered surgery um, until I was in my third year medical student or third year medical student. And my first placement was in plastic surgery. 
And I hadn't a clue what they did. And I went in and I was there like, here's me, this future eminent gastroenterologist being sent to watch a load of bo boobs and Botox all day. And um, I went into a plastic trauma theater and there was a guy whose two fingers had been cut off and they were putting them back on and something I didn't realize he could do. They got out their microscope. They were connecting kind of the vessels back together with kind of um, like tenno suture, which is much finer than human hair. And I was looking at this and I was just saying, this is unbelievable. And um, the Reg who was doing it, um, who's still my mentor and is a consultant now, um, he just said, I need someone to hold the fingers. Do you know how to scrub? And I was there like, no. And he was like, I'll show you. Um, so off you go. And I've kind of been engrossed in plastic surgery ever since. Um, yeah, it's it's something I find incredibly rewarding. It's the whole interaction of structure and function. And if you can understand how the what the structure of something is or the function, you can restore that. Um, and it's really rewarding kind of we do deal with a huge amount of kind of cancer reconstruction and trauma. So you do have people who come in and it could be kind of they're going for a mastectomy and you're going to do something that can really improve their quality of life after and you can do a really good reconstruction and it's technically challenging and you're with the patient and it's not just a one day kind of thing you do form a relationship with them you know them beforehand you know them after and you kind of see how they get on um and it is really rewarding to build these kind of connections with patients and you kind of it's not just you're in you're out um and you do end up taking pride in your work kind of someone's cut their tendon you put it back together they came in their finger couldn't bend and now their finger bends normally and it's incredibly rewarding that someone who kind of is a manual worker who couldn't use their hands is now gone back to work kind of a couple of months later um and again kind of it's really it's surprising kind of i chose plastic surgery for the same reasons that kind of barbara chose general surgery and megan chose vascular surgeries i thought it was fascinating i thought it was incredibly varied and you can do whatever you want um i got on well with the people who were there as well you do have many mentors I found them to be a very nice bunch, but everyone said that their own specialty has that person. So I think you choose your specialty on one and the people you're going to work with in the future um, and they'll get on with you as well. Um, and it's just something yeah, that I've been very lucky every job I've gone to. I found that the bosses were nice. They were willing to train you. Um, you do have to some, take some ownership of your training as well if you're not going to play ball then you're just going to be left behind um you do have to go in you have to have a good work ethic you have to know what to get out of it and as you go on kind of during your training you realize that kind of there are things that people told you very early on that you didn't really pay attention to and it's funny like barbara was told this is what you need to do to get on the scheme i was told that as well but i kind of was like megan i was like oh yeah Grand, yeah, so someone told me that and I kind of didn't pay attention to it at the time. I kind of kicked myself slightly after, um, but you get there. Um, so it is, it's funny that you do have to really work hard um, at kind of doing stuff. You have to be seen as a good colleague yourself and someone who kind of your consultants want to teach, you want to train and you'll get the most out of it. Um, I love what I do still kind of, I kind of 13 years ago, I was in Connor's position and um, I kind of too was involved in the Surgical Society. I can't speak highly enough about kind of getting involved in them um, because it does give you more exposure. Um, and that's really what surgery is about, is getting as much exposure to either your own specialty or other specialties. You do have to know what everyone else is kind of thinking and doing. Um, something could come into you that you would know well that someone else will do better uh, in a different specialty. And I think that's a huge benefit of surgery and the surgical training and kind of things like charity day where you get to see what other people are doing um, and learning from that. And I think that should really be supported. Um, so yeah, so that's why I chose plastics. And Billy, when will you transition into consultant practice? What's your timetable for becoming a consultant? I'm ST7 now, so I am in doing six months in the matter next year and then I'm going on fellowship, hopefully, um, and then fellowship for a year um, doing hand surgery and then try to get a consultant job. And can you maybe give us some background on the fellowship itself 
and perhaps why you did chose to do a fellowship in the first place? Um, so the, I really like hand surgery and I wanted to do, so one of the benefits of uh, plastic surgery is that it kind of deals with both adult and children um, in an elective and a kind of cute setting. So I, when I was a medical student in Cork, I really got involved with the plastic surgery team and they organised my elective to go to Leeds, uh, which is one of the biggest hand surgery centres in the UK. And they do hand transplant. So I'm going to be a hand transplant fellow, uh, which I don't think is going to be uh, one of my major skill sets when I come back from it. But it's also it's a huge volume of both elective and hand trauma. Um, so I think that hands are incredibly important to someone. So I it is it's important going through your training. Actually, everyone's on about making yourself competitive for your C or for, to get your HST kind of job. Uh, when you kind of get further on, once you've got on the scheme, you kind of sit back a bit. But you really do need to keep working because you do need to make yourself as competitive as possible to actually get a good fellowship. Um, there is lots of fellowships out of there. There are some that are very highly regarded. There are some that's not. And you want to get one that's a really, really good fellowship. So you do need to have a competitive CV. I was lucky um, in that I had done my elective there and they kind of knew me and I had met them subsequently at multiple conferences after and they knew who they were dealing with. Um, before I kind of even got into the interview, I was like, hi, they were like, oh, we know who you are. How are you? Grand. What do you think you can bring? And I had a CV that could back up that I was an acceptable candidate for it. Um, so I do think, yeah, that as you go through your training, kind of there is the whole, oh, I have my CV now. You do really need to kind of keep going to conferences, writing papers, making presentations. You do need to get yourself known if you want to get that fellowship. And there, yeah, yeah, and it's kind of it, like I've met some of my future colleagues kind of who are going to be like my co-fellows and stuff like that. And they seem like a really good bunch. So I'm really looking forward to it. It sounds like, you know, that first experience you had in the operating theatre, where you described the case of the patient who was having two fingers reimplanted, it sounds like that had an enormous influence on you because now you're going on to do a hand transplant fellowship. Um, absolutely. Um, and that's why I think, yeah, everyone should always be nice to the medical students. You don't know what impact that's going to have on someone. And I've known people who've kind of really gone in and wanted to do a career and were like, I'm not doing that. They're not nice people. And uh, fortunately, no one from that specialty are, is here. Uh, but there are there are things that can kind of put people off and you don't know kind of the impact you're going to have someone. And you could lose a fantastic colleague that you're going to have in the future because you don't have the time. So I would really encourage everyone to kind of just get involved. And if someone doesn't have the time, maybe there is something going on. There could be some, they could be really, really busy. Um, so I wouldn't write them off for that. But I do think yeah, that you should try and uh, just get involved, see as much as possible. And you'll find something like the next case could have been something equally as fascinating. And that could have shaped my career. I've seen loads of really cool things as I've gone on. And yeah, it's kind of come back to just coincidentally, um, the first thing I saw is what I ended up doing. Um, don't think that's necessarily going to be the case for everyone. It wasn't mine and uh, I regret nothing in that sense. Um, I I possibly did pigeonhole myself actually quite early and this is what I want to do. And I don't necessarily think that that was a good thing. It wasn't necessarily a bad thing either. Everyone always knew I was going to do plastics and I was going to do hands. Um, and the further you go on your training, people are like, oh, yeah, hands are something that people become really familiar with in plastics quite early on because the volume of trauma that you're exposed to, um, it's mainly hand trauma. So you get very comfortable in hand surgery. And usually kind of the second and third SPRs are like, oh, I'm going to do hand. It's because it's what you're good at and you enjoy and it's your operation. But then people go on and as they get more senior, there's kind of more technical aspects um, that they don't really kind of understand and the nuances of other kind of specialties kind of like breast reconstruction or head and neck cancer reconstruction um, and you don't really get as comfortable with um, the basics of those early on um, it's usually for more senior training so usually kind of second third year trainees are oh i'm doing hands from plastics 
as they go on, they kind of move on and realize that there's more to life than hands. Um, I enjoyed the other aspects of it, and I do want to keep up the generality of plastics in my career going forward, but I want to specialize in adult and children's hand is my main area. Yes, I will do some breast reconstruction. Yes, I will do head and neck cancer reconstruction. I'll do burns. Um, uh, but I think yeah, my main special interest will be adult and children's hands. Um, it just I find it very rewarding, kind of the restoration of kind of function that you can give someone, or if you have a child who's a very kind of complex hand that will give them poor function, that you can do something to restore that. So I think that's really rewarding. Thank you very much, Billy. So again, your enthusiasm seems to inspire you to be continually engaged with your specialty. And as you said, you've mentioned the importance of generality within training as well, that you can have a specialty interest, but you also have to have the generality of training for your particular specialty itself. Khalid, uh, you're working in ENT surgery as a first year SPR. At ST3 level, can you give us some insights into why you decided to pursue ENT surgery as a career? Yeah, of course. So I was, again, incredibly lucky to have made my decision on my specialty as a medical student. And it was actually the second, half, second year of medical school when I was doing head and neck anatomy in RCSI. And we were taught by retired surgeons. And two, two in particular were Mr. Alec Blaney and Professor Michael Early, um, a head and neck surgeon and obviously a plastics and reconstructive surgeon. And just the way they explained head and neck anatomy and seeing the dissections and the level of detail in the anatomy really kind of piqued my interest. And then when I did my third year rotation in Beaumont, I saw patients coming back after cochlear implantation who had just had the most extraordinary outcomes, you know, being born with profound sensory neural hearing loss and just going to a point where they could have a very real function and engage in social interactions and have a normal livelihood. So all of those kind of things kind of took me down a path where I felt I had made my decision very early on. And while I tried to keep as open-minded as possible, I knew I was doing an intern job in ENT once I qualified. And that was the first job I did three months in Beaumont. And again, like that, I had incredible mentors, both at a registrar level, SHO level and consultant level. And um, people like Professor Laura Biani, Professor Helena Rowley, James Paul O'Neill, um, who's the professor in RCSI, and then people like Conal Fitzgerald, who's a current registrar, and all of these people, their incredible passion for what they did, what they were interested in, their ability to give you their time and explain the pathway, just really drove something in me. And I knew straight off the bat I was going to do CST once I finished my internship, and I knew I was going to apply immediately to HST to just keep going down that route. And I certainly haven't been disappointed um, when I worked as an SHO in ENT in second year. Every day was just like waking up to do the best thing in the world. You know, every single patient is different, different aspects of the specialty. You've got ophthalmology, rhinology, facial plastics, head and neck oncology, and um, reconstructive aspects. And every little bit of that, every patient's so different. Their family members are so different. You've got pediatrics, you've got elderly patients, you've got patients everywhere in between. And the operations are so varied, you know, on a Tuesday, you could be at an autology list and seeing microscopic surgery of the year. And on a Wednesday, you could be in a head and neck oncology list where you're seeing complex resections of the head and neck region, neck dissections, which are just incredible from an anatomical perspective. And it's just extraordinary. You know, everybody I've worked with has been very, very supportive, very, very kind to me. And I think the mentors I've had have become, as well as friends, continuous mentors through my training to this point so far. And again, as everybody said, you can have such an incredible influence on people behind you. And I've had so many people who are doing internships or as medical students who have contacted me, contacted me to discuss the specialty, to discuss core surgical training. And you just don't realize that one little conversation can change someone's perspective so much. And I certainly credit those little experiences that may seem very superficial with driving me towards what I wanted to do ultimately. So again, what I'm learning from listening to you very carefully is that, is that not only did you choose surgery as a career, as a medical student, you also chose a particular branch of surgery while you were a medical student. And that's something that most of you have brought out today during conversation as well. So, you know, that's certainly something that highlights the importance of looking after the medical students. And if you like, giving them early exposure to surgery within the medical school curriculum. 
So it seems to be something that has influenced all of you to a very significant extent, maybe without realizing it at the time. But as you've come through, and as you've said, you knew when you were going on to the core surgical training program that you wanted to become an ENT surgeon. And you mentioned various mentors. So how did you structure your core surgical training program, Khaled? Yeah, so um, I think I was very open-minded for first year in that I was willing to do whatever job I would get the most learning out of. But I directed my focus towards one particular job, which I was very lucky to be matched to, and that was um, general endocrine breast with urology in Beaumont. And I sort of had that in mind from the perspective of the general job I knew was very varied. There was a lot of kind of things like endocrine, breast. So I got to see thyroids and parathyroids. And then there was a lot of everything in between from a general surgical perspective. And funnily enough, um, while urology is the opposite end of the body, I thought it was an incredible learning opportunity for when I went on to ENT because most of what I did as the first year SHO was flexible cystoscopies. And that I got to do hundreds of flexible cystoscopies in a six month period. And that was a skill that was incredibly transferable when I start working in ENT because I found I knew how to do a flexible nasoendoscope then. It was just changing the anatomical location. So it's strange how even though it's completely separate specialty, it can be very, very useful. So I'd say pick your core jobs very, very carefully. Recognize that there's a learning opportunity in every single one of them. And at the end of the day, we're here to serve patients. And so you'll learn from every single patient you interact with. And um, yeah, for sure. But talk to people who've done the jobs because I had spoken to two or three people who did the same job and every single one of them encouraged me towards it. Khaled, outside of surgery and outside of surgical training, what types of hobbies or interests do you have? So from the point of view of your personal time, how do you take your mind away from surgery? Particularly if you've had a very busy or a stressful day. Yeah, so um, for better or worse, I'm an Arsenal supporter. Um, so I really like football, but uh, a lot of struggles over the last few years. Um, I try to do some cycling most weeks. So I do long distance cycling, usually on a Saturday and Sunday. And that's certainly something that helps me switch off. And I'm really into cooking. And I find that that's something that even though it's not directly surgical, it's doing something with your hands. It's making you think of multiple steps at once. And that's really, really useful as well. So they're the sort of things I do kind of generally to relax. Very good. So, Connor, I'm going to give the last word to you as the medical student on the platform today. From what you've listened to over the past hour or thereabouts, would you like to give us your final thoughts on medical students deciding on a career in surgery and the various factors that would influence them and how they would prepare to enter a career in surgery? Yeah, so, um, you know, this session has been brilliant uh, from my own personal perspective of you know, hearing everyone's insights, who's, as I mentioned earlier, a little further up the mountain that I want to climb. Um, and it's brilliant that this has been recorded so that it will be shared with students, not only in Ireland, but across, you know, the UK and I suppose anyone who has access to, to YouTube. But, um, you know, from the perspective of like a medical student who maybe isn't quite sure that they want to go into a career in surgery, you know, maybe over the last two years with COVID, they didn't get to have the experience of having an, you know, an incredible dissection class with, you know, one of these legends in, in surgery in Ireland. And, you know, you don't want to jump into research straight away because again, you're not sure. I think becoming a member of your university surgical society is the way to go um, because you can get a lot of broad exposure. And I know, you know, everyone has mentioned that they specialized very early on, and I think I fall into that boat as well. But if you're not sure about what specialty you want to do, you know, the surgical societies, they give you an opportunity to hear from consultants and registrars, you know, across many specialties. So whether you're interested in becoming a robotic GI surgeon, a pediatric cardiothoracic surgeon, or an ENT surgeon, you know, you're... Uh, your surgical society in your university, it will have something for you. Um, so I guess to summarize, and I think this is what we've all sort of said this morning was, you know, why do students choose surgery and some don't? And I think it really comes down to, you know, those small moments with registrars, SHOs and consultants, and they help foster the environments that support students, you know, to want to climb the mountain. And, uh, you know, I'm incredibly grateful for 
all of those moments that I've had as a student. And, you know, I think that um, as students, we should also bear in mind that, you know, surgeons are people too. And if they've had a bad day and maybe you haven't, you know, uh, gotten as much teaching as you would hope, you know, maybe try and make time for it or, you know, invite them to speak at your university surgical society and give them a platform to have an opportunity to be as, you know, inspiring as, um, you know, all the surgeons that have inspired everyone here this evening. So I'd like to thank our medical student and our trainees from the various surgical specialties for all of the insights you've given to us uh, about surgical training. I really found that fascinating. And I'd like to thank you all so much for giving us your time and your insights. And I wish you all the very best. Now, having listened uh, to the views of our trainees, I'd like to talk to the people who helped to train them. So I'm now delighted to welcome Sarah Early today, who's the clinical lead of cardiothoracic surgery at St. James's Hospital. Sarah, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. So I'd like to ask you as we begin, begin our interview today, what motivated you to become a surgeon? So my inspiration to become a surgeon, um, I, uh, when I was a little kid, when I was about five, my best friend died from a congenital cardiac abnormality and her death affected me massively um but to say that's the sole reason i became a cardiac surgeon is not really accurate um i get when i was in school science and art were the main two subjects that i was interested in and i didn't really see any role for modern day leonardo i wasn't quite that good and so i felt that medicine or surgery might be better at paying the bills so that was the main reason i became a, a surgeon and you're working at the present time as a cardiothoracic surgeon at saint james's hospital in dublin so from the point of view of your day-to-day -day work, would you like to give us some insights into your day-to-day -day surgical work and the rewards of choosing a surgical career from your perspective? Um, so I work in St. James's Hospital, as, as you said, as a cardiac surgeon, and it is a very uh, humbling job, um, and it's a really super job. The thing I like most about my job is that there are it's this huge variety um, there are, you know, and although the operations are all pretty standard, the thing that makes it different is each patient and each patient comes with their own particular concerns, worries and, you know, anatomy, past medical history, which, which makes it a little bit more challenging and, and tailoring each person's operation so that they get the best outcome is, 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 is a great part of the job. Also, really in any specialty of surgery, I imagine, um, you get to engage with patients um, when they're vulnerable, nervous, worried, frightened, and they let you into their life. And that is, it's such an honor. And it's, um, it, it's, it's something that it's important to always remember. And so, you know, in other people's jobs, I think potentially they, they, they may get really stressed or, you know, overwhelmed but in our job you always have to go back to the patient and realize that you're in a really special place and however stressed out you are the patient is probably more so and so you know it's very grounding so the, there's loads of elements of the job that are just fab in that like it's, it's it can be challenging um technically it's it's, it's it can be very complex there's a, a wide array of procedures and then there's patients who who are who you're doing something and they're in the main, really, really grateful. So it's, it's just an amazing job. And as you said, it's technically a very demanding specialty. So you also mentioned that it can be stressful at times. So how do you in your personal life achieve a work-life balance? Or indeed, is it possible to achieve a work-life balance as a cardiothoracic surgeon? I think it's very, very difficult. Uh, to achieve a work-life balance. I'd like to think that it's that I'm doing it, but but I know from my family and friends that I'm I'm not doing a great job. However, one of the most important things I think if you want to be a cardiac surgeon is you have to want to do it more than you want to breathe because it will take every little bit of you and then some, um, but it will give back in huge amounts. And so it's it's not a case that you're sacrificing because you you know you enjoy doing it um but it, it is going to take everything to do it and to do it well and I don't even be 
be particularly good, just to be a good surgeon. I'm not talking about being a great surgeon or the best surgeon, just to be a good cardiac surgeon, it takes a huge amount from you. And so what's really important is to have a good, strong family network of family, friends, and, and people to understand because the number of dinners and parties and holidays and things that you will not be able to attend despite your very best efforts will, will be quite considerable and so i guess the thing is it's that you, it doesn't bother you because if you resent it that will be a problem but if it's a case that what you're going in to do is something that really fulfills you and you're passionate about and you love then you don't mind like you i don't mind being in here um working you know, missing out on a dinner because sadly I may have as much fun in here. Um, and I, I think that's important. Like if, if you find, and that's what I say to juniors coming through, find something that you're passionate about because then it's not really a job. You know, it's 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 every day you're doing something. I'm so lucky to every day come in and have, who knows what I'll have. You know, like yesterday there was an emergency aortic and infective endocarditis with a big root abscess but really nobody knew what was going on he was transferred over as an emergency from another hospital last week there was a young guy with a neurotic dissection and then in between all of that is the standard normal bypass grafting valve surgery so no day is the same you know when you think you're going to get out of five somebody else comes in with another problem and that's okay and and again it's really important maybe never to make a plan because you always have to cancel so make no plans and then you're never cancelling um, but it is difficult for your family and friends because, you know, and, and it is important that you try and you, you, you know, you do make time. You have to make time because as my daughter says to me, come on, mom, there must be somebody else who can do it. Like you're not the only doctor in the hospital and she's just turned four. So she possibly has more insight than I do. You sound incredibly enthusiastic about your work as a cardiothoracic surgeon. And how do you project that enthusiasm, if you like, and that passion for your craft to younger trainees or medical students who may be attached to your surgical team? Um, I, I think, you know, just in, enjoying your do job and being here and being involved. Um, I remember once when I was working as a fellow in London, um, I had an SHO who said to me, Rurik, we were coming into theatre one day and she said, you know, Sarah, I didn't really think, you know, about being a cardiac surgeon. I kind of thought that it would be really hard. But, um, you know, like, it, it, I kind of think if you can do it, really, anybody can do it. So I looked at her and I was like, well, that's really charming. Thanks very much, Doreen. And she's like, no, no, I mean it in the best possible way. You make it look really easy. So I think it's trying to be grounded, trying to be reasonable, looking to everybody in the team. Like everybody has something to offer, even if it's one of the interns. Like they've gone through medicine more recently than I have, and they may have information to add. So I think bringing everybody with you, listening to everybody on the team, getting everyone involved, because even yourself, medical students are like the brightest people in the world. Our surgical trainees are phenomenally intelligent. And I think listening and you know you know listening to the whole team and everybody being involved and i think that's important and then that creates a good atmosphere that people are keen to work and and also then in theater trying to get the trainees because we have quite a number of trainees coming through the system getting them involved and operating and you know there's lots of parts of cardiac you might kind of think well cardiac surgery what could they do there's lots of bits of cardiac surgery that people can do you know it's just a case of being in the case with them for the whole thing so reflecting on your own surgical training from the time you graduated from medical school, how many years in total did you spend in surgical training before you became a consultant cardiothoracic surgeon? Ten. So I was, I was very lucky in that I, I managed to kind of get through the process quite quickly. Um, it was rather streamlined. So I had lots of kind of, you know, it was just, I mean, there was there was good fortune, but also there was loads of hard work. So I I remember when I was appointed as a consultant in James's, they said to me there was new contracts coming in. They'd actually just come out, I think, that month, and they were looking at like trying to decide what they would pay me. And, and they said, Oh, well, I see you've got a higher degree, or you've got two higher degrees. Um, and I said, Yeah, and a fellowship. And I said, Yeah. And they said, well, these higher degrees, you've got an MD and an MA in ethics and law and an MD in molecular biology. But you did those at the same time. So really, we can only give you marks for one. 
And I was like, surely doing them at the same time shows that I worked really, really hard and you should give me like extra marks. So no, no, no. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think um, having swum, I swum a lot as a kid and, you know, what as a younger person would swim like five hours a day nearly. And so you manage to then, while going to school, you manage to fit loads of things into a day. Like, so days, 24 hours are actually quite long and you can fit a lot into 24 hours in this case of packing in as much as possible. Um, so I, yeah, I just try to get through things as quickly as possible. When you were a surgical trainee, what helped you in terms of progressing your career and deciding on where you would end up eventually working as a consultant? Um, hard work, loads of it, and then more hard work. So it really is, for surgery, there's just no getting away from it. Like, And, and again, going back to the kind of, I think, having had, had good grounding in sport as a kid, I recognise that hard work got your results. And the good thing about medicine and in any sort of academic pursuit, the more work you put in, the better your result is going to be. Sport actually isn't like that. You might put in all this work and get no return. And so um, having been quite active and sporty as a kid, I was used to failure. I was used to not winning. Um, you know, that was just a normal part of being in sport. And so then when you went into a more academic area and went into medicine, every bit that you put in, you actually got a return. So the more you put in, the higher the return. Um, and so I guess it's just it's just such a it's such a great job in that if you work hard, you get great, great rewards, if that's what you're into, rewards. So, Sarah, how do you cope as a surgeon in a very technically demanding specialty when things don't go right? And say, for example, when the outcome of a surgical procedure doesn't go according to plan, how do you deal with that on a personal level? It's very challenging. Um, I'm very lucky in James's, I have some super co colleagues and, and also here, not just surgical colleagues, but sort of supports like support staff, like the anaesthetic cardiac anaesthetists are phenomenally good, our radiologists are cardiologists. So I think surrounding yourself with good people, making appropriate decisions preoperatively, like involving the MDT and using the MDT, and, and always surrounding yourself with good, good people so that when you decide to do an operation and if the outcome is bad, that you have looked into all of the different options. Even if that means like potentially during the operation, calling for help or getting other people involved so that when you go into an operation, you have reasonable, you have a reasonable idea about the outcome and have prepared the other people involved in the operation, uh, like depending on what the case may be. Of course, a case that should be reasonably straightforward can go wrong and that that can that's probably the most horrific thing for a surgeon and um, when you have an unexpected death um, that can be really difficult to manage um, and cardiac surgery unfortunately there's always that possibility you know even for our most straightforward cases like the risk of death is between 0.5 and 1 percent which is actually quite high you know um, uh, and 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 I guess then Dealing with that, it's, it's a case of sort of debriefing, being like calling on the other people that were involved. Often I would talk to one of my other colleagues here, Mike Tolan, who's a superb surgeon, really, really good colleague, you know, and very supportive. And we may run through the case or even some of the other colleagues. There's another cardiac surgeon, Lars Oke, in the matter, who's excellent. Um, and I think that's really important to discuss uh, complications, to discuss bad outcomes so that you know, you can look and see, was there anything that you could improve, anything that you could change, try and prevent anything like that happening again. But it does, it does really, it, it affects me hugely when, when I have a death, for sure. Finally, if I was to say to you, turn the clock back to the time that you were a final year medical student, what advice would you give to your younger self? Um... What advice would I give to yourself? I would say um, celebrate every small win. Um, be kind to yourself. Be kind to other people. Um, life is very, very short. Um, don't wait, waste a second. Don't waste a second of it. 
and pick something that you're passionate about because it's not really a job. So that would be it. And in fact, when I went, when I was in SHO, I loved all surgery. And I remember I met Professor Kern and I said, Professor Kern, I just don't know what I should be when I grow up. And he was like, oh, cop onto yourself here, like pick something. And I said, but like everything is wonderful. And he's like, what do you love most? What do you love the absolute most? And I was like, oh, cardiac, but it's a bit crazy. And he said, we'll do it. You know, and when I went to all the other specialties, the surgeons are all different. And no matter what specialty I went to and said, you know, what advice would you give me or what do you think I should do? Like across the board, unanimously, people said, do the job that makes you happiest. So I think that would be my main piece of advice. Do the job that makes you happiest. Thank you, Sarah. And it's been lovely to talk with you today and great to hear your insights on a career in cardiothoracic surgery. Now I'd like to welcome Farhad Karadmant, consultant urologist and kidney transplant surgeon in Dubai. So Farhad, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me today. And I'd like to begin by asking you, what was your inspiration to become a surgeon? Or why did you as a medical student, uh, why did you decide that you were going to pursue a career in surgery? Uh, thank you, Kevin, for having me. Um, why I chose surgery? Um, I like surgery um, beforehand uh, that I came to, to do uh, medicine. Um, during the medical uh, rotations, um, you know, in the RCSI after year three, we go to uh, clinical rotation. And my luck was one of the rotation was in Bowman Hospital attached to urology and kidney transplantation. Uh, at that time, uh, Mr. David Hickey, he was the, um, the head of department of urology and kidney transplantation. And we used to go and do round, be in the theater with him, do uh, go to the, um, uh, the you know, ward rounds and the clinics. So when I saw this and how transplantation makes a big difference uh, to people life, uh, people who are in um, kidney failure, they have to be dialyzed, they are attached to a machine, uh, they cannot go back to work. And after transplantation, we could see there are different people, even immediately they feel much better. So that's something that inspired me. And at that time, there are a few of us and everyone was saying, you know, I said, I like to become a urologist. And everyone's telling me it's extremely difficult, very competitive. Um, I wasn't the best student. I was an average of students. And so that's uh, what inspired me to become a urologist. So I chose surgery. And at that time, I had to do basic surgical training. Uh, after internship in Beaumont Hospital, I did basic surgery training. I got the Southeast scheme uh, that was involved going to Kilkenny for six months and a year and a half in Waterford Regional Hospital. Um, I finished that successfully and I did my MRCS exam. And at that time, there was a bottleneck to do, um, you know, um, to hire surgical, to do the higher surgical training. And I always wanted to do a urology. Um, there weren't many options and it was, you know, uh, the numbers were very small. So I had to do other things to improve my CV. And uh, during this, uh, before finishing this uh, basic surgical tra training, there was a job came up as an anatomy demonstrator in the College of Surgeons uh, in Dublin. And uh, I applied to that and luckily I got the job. And at that time, Professor Clabby, who was the um, head of the Department of Anatomy and RCSI, he took me on and he said, well, we have a project for you. And, um, you know, the project involved dissecting a, a cadaver and putting it online and make it interactive for, uh, for the students. And that project went really well. I spent two years uh, as an anatomy demonstrator, and I always wanted to go back to surgery. So Professor Clively allowed me to go to Beaumont Hospital uh, to be with um, uh, Mr. David Hickey. And uh, that time I got to, you know, to assist in surgeries, to be with the team, and always they needed extra hands. So on call, I used to say, you know, any weekend I'm free, I can come and, and be there with them. And uh, that's uh, how I, uh, I, after two years, I got my first uh, job as a urology registrar in Bowman Hospital. 
it's very interesting uh, to listen to your journey, and it's very obvious listening to your story that you were incredibly determined uh, to become a urologist, and no obstacle was ever going to stand in your way. Also, it sounds like the role of the various people that helped you along your pathway was critical. Like you mentioned, uh, Mr. Hickey and Professor Clive Lee. So mentorship and its role in surgery. What are your thoughts on the importance of mentorship, particularly from the perspective of a surgical trainee and in order to promote good quality surgical training across the world? Mentorship is extremely important in medicine in general, and especially in surgery. Mentorship is, you know, that someone who has gone through the, uh, the pathway, has gone through the, um, uh, the same basic obstacles, is very important that someone can advise you. Um, so I had, a, I had really good mentors, Professor Clav Lee from anatomy department who guided me, who could, someone who helped me, he, he's, a, he's a surgeon as well. And then I got to know uh, Mr. David Hickey. Uh, and also my other peers that, you know, they can advise you, my senior colleagues who can advise you to take uh, the, the routes. Uh, also in surgery, it's very important, um, the, the um, you know, the concept, the concept of uh, apprenticeship. OK, that someone who can take you on and basically learn in a busy department, in a surgery, be it surgery and clinical, in difficult situation, dealing with difficult patients and different ca cases and complications. This is extremely important. And also, it's very important to have a role model. Someone that you say, I want to be like this person. And my role model was David Hickey. Um, how he cared about the patient, how he cared about um, the students, the staff, the nurses. So that's something that I got really inspired to be someone uh, like David Hickey. Um, and and uh, really, I was lucky to have him as my mentor and as my role model. One of the things I'd like to ask you about is your role as an examiner um, in postgraduate surgical examining. Um, it's obvious from listening to you that you're incredibly enthusiastic about your work. So as a doctor, as a surgeon, uh, we are automatically teachers and we train uh, our junior doctors and students. Um, examination is part of this training, okay? It's part of the curriculum. The assessment is very important. And especially in surgery that, you know, these are the future generations. These are the people. I look at my juniors as someone who's going to operate on me, or operate on my family, on our community. So this is very important to have this role as, as that something that we can give back to be an examiner, to set a standard and set questions. So this is, I think, is very important part of our um, profession and our job. Sounds like you're incredibly enthusiastic about your job. What advice would you give to your younger self if you were back in 2002 and you had just graduated from the RCSI Medical School? Yeah, so if you just graduated, I know many people will say postgraduate, you know, all of you, I encourage you to do postgraduate, become a specialized in, in the specialty that you like, something that you love and you really feel strong that you want to be this um, uh, specialist. Um, yes, there are some special, uh, specialities that are difficult uh, more than the others, but there are ways if you put the time, if you put the work and become, you know, be dedicated to become, to go through the training, uh, to go different places, okay, you may not find in one country, there could be, you could travel to another place. So your determination and follow what you love. Um, don't let anything stop you. Yes, higher surgical training is very difficult. Subspeciality training is very difficult, very competitive. But if you if you put the work and you give the time and dedication, you can make it. I made it, you can make it. Thanks, Farid. And it sounds like your choice of urology as a specialty was the perfect choice for you and that you love what you do but equally, you seem to be getting the work-life balance spot on.
Now I'd like to introduce Colin Pierce, who is a consultant colorectal and general surgeon at University Hospital Limerick, but who was also hugely knowledgeable in robotic surgery. So Colin, thank you very much for taking time out from your very busy clinical schedule to speak with me today. So I'd like to begin by asking you, what was your inspiration to becoming a surgeon in the first place? Thanks, Kevin, and uh, thanks very much for, for having me. That's a, that's a difficult question, and I, I, I won't lie and say that I knew I wanted to be a surgeon when I was five or ten. I didn't, and I didn't really know until uh, probably the very end of my medical school career. And I would like to think uh, that I'm maybe somewhat of a, a simple creature, and, and medicine just seemed that little bit yes or no, more factual, uh, with clear decision making maybe than, than other subspecialities might might have uh, appealed to me. So I uh, made a concerted effort then in my intern year to become quite involved uh, during my surgical intern jobs and applied to the scheme. And uh, as they would say that the rest is, has been history. So um, it was kind of a late, a late comer. I didn't know the whole way through medical school, but certainly I think what really got me very interested was obviously when I had the opportunity to scrub as a student and really see what goes on. Um, and the, the thought has always appealed to me that a surgical patient is fixed by your hands, whereas potentially a medical patient is more fixed by a tablet and uh, he might not feel as, as, as involved. So I, I guess that, that side has always appealed to me as well. And was there any particular individual or mentor that influenced your decision to commence a career in surgery? I have to admit my first job as an intern was with uh, Professor Kevin Connell in Tala University Hospital, and he was extremely encouraging. Uh, he has a great enthusiasm, as you would well know, for uh, surgery, uh, both clinical and uh, on an academic and research uh, uh, portfolio side too. So uh, he really uh, kind of get, maybe get the bit between my teeth, I guess, and 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 uh, pursue the, the subsequent uh, interviews to get on the scheme, et cetera, that year. Now, I know that you work as a consultant general and colorectal surgeon, and you have a particular interest in robotic surgery. So could you give us some insights into your surgical day, and what would you consider the rewards of working as a surgeon? Yeah, I guess every, every day is different, but to focus on, our, on a robotic day, uh, we use the, the robot here in, in Limerick um, on a Thursday from a colorectal standpoint. Um, and we know that it's going to be a long day. Uh, it's one where you, you need the weed of X in and you need everyone uh, singing from the same hymn sheet because ultimately uh, a lot of what goes into robotic surgery is not just me doing the operation. It's a real team effort um, from portering to nursing staff to anesthesia to setting up the theatre. Uh, so that gives everyone a really good feeling at the end of the day when you've done a couple of big, long, fancy operations uh, and everyone has uh, put their shoulder to the wheel and a good day's work has been had. So uh, we would tend to, to start operating in around nine o'clock. And if I go by last week's example, we might finish it up maybe half seven, eight o'clock in the evening. They're long operations uh, which require quite a lot of concentration. Uh, but very fulfilling because when you go and see these patients on a Friday morning, when I'm in seeing them at 7, 7.30, they're out of bed, they're walking around, they're having something to eat. And yes, they know they've had an operation, but they certainly don't know that they've been operated on for four or five hours, had the majority of their bowel removed, etc. Um, so really the insults from a surgical standpoint that they show to us is, is minimalized compared uh, to maybe what would have been the case uh, 15, 20 years ago. From the point of view then of training and interactions on a daily basis with surgical trainees, can you give me some insights into how you teach more advanced surgical techniques, including robotic surgery, to trainees who would be assigned to work in your department? Yeah, so it's a, uh... Robotic surgery lends itself very well to training um, and that's on a couple of fronts. Uh, firstly, there is a simulator whereby a number of technical skills can be tested. Uh, indeed, more and more we're now seeing where you can actually perform an operation 
in a simulated setting. Um, that's coming uh, to fruition more in the colorectal field in recent times. And we would expect, and the trainees would know, that they will need to do a certain number of hours uh, to the extent of 50 hours or more on the simulator, get their skills up to speed before they would potentially uh, sit at the console and perform uh, live surgery. And that brings us to the second part really of the training. To my mind, there is no better way to train than on a robotic platform when you have a dual console. So you have two consoles akin to a pilot and a co-pilot and a cockpit. Uh, you and I, if we were operating together, uh, sit right alongside each other. We're both seeing the exact same view. I'm not elbowing you out of the way and you're not digging me in the ribs to get me out of your way. And with the, the one click of a button, the operation and the instruments and who's controlling them gets immediately transferred from one surgeon to the other. Uh, so you can really uh, give exact instruction to your trainee, show them exactly how you want something to be done, and then they can mirror that straight away after you. There's no positional changes, someone else holding the camera, moving around at the bedside. So a dual console um, robotic platform, in our opinion as robotic surgeons, is probably as good as one can get in terms of being able to really technically train uh, specific operations. It's the perfect opportunity to be joined by Des Winter. Des, who is a laparoscopic gastrointestinal surgeon at St. Vincent's University Hospital in Dublin. And I see, Des, you're wearing your scrub gear and it's almost seven o'clock in the evening. So that suggests to me that you've been operating all day long. So from your point of view, how did today go for you as a surgeon? Yeah, today went very well, thanks very much. Uh, this, of course, is life as a surgeon. It's a little bit, little bit unpredictable in terms of, uh, of, of your finish time. Um, but I can't think of a more rewarding way to spend your day than, uh, than uh, operating and doing your level best with a pretty big team to try to make uh, a difference to patients and, and bring about some you know, some serious healthcare changes for them. It's not just simply rearranging anatomy. So by the time you finish making your notes and calling relatives and uh, doing ward rounds and everything after operations, yeah, it's, it's, we're often still at hospital. So I'm sorry about that. I'm still at the hospital wearing scrubs, apologies. I was hoping to be at home in a comfortable armchair. How did you become interested in research within surgical training? Uh, even as a medical student, I was interested not just in what we were learning in textbooks, but also because it struck me, I'm sure you all felt the same, didn't did, we all did, that a lot of what we learned in the textbooks was already out of date in those days when the lecturer, the professor was usually giving us insights into uh, things that were changing already. Because in those days, it's hard for modern day people to remember this, but in those days, the electronic literature did not exist. And we had to look through books and things, you know, it was difficult. So even back in those days, I was keen to learn about the, you know, the, what was current, what was actually changing and, and happening. And surgery was the field, uh, other than physiology, I think that uh, that sort of tickled me most. So in fact, I started getting, oh my God, I first got the BGS, the British Journal of Surgery as a medical student, as a, as a personal a subscription uh, and that's not today or yesterday that's a long time ago that's maybe 30 years ago i got that um in order just to sort of have a grasp of what was going on and i inhaled it i every single word i've never been so excited uh, since the days of when i got comics uh, again the the younger generation won't remember these but the paper comics we used to get as children mm -hmm. used to order it from your local news agent that it came in every once a week and we would hang outside the news agent waiting for the van to arrive with copies of whatever it was, the Marvel comics, the the, the uh, DC comics that you now see of Spider-Man and all of these other characters, all, all came out of that. And that was, what an exciting time. But in my older times, the only other thing that really excited me, I have to say, perhaps sad as it sounds, was when those surgical journals used to hit. And by the time I was a surgical trainee, I was um, subscribing, I think, to about five journals. And I, I just couldn't wait, I inhaled it all. I was fascinated with the, um, rapidly changing technological world, I think in particular of surgery and, uh, and and how that was going to impact on patients and uh, uh, what we had to do. And I was hooked, that was it. I mean, as far as I was concerned, this was a, a, a rocket ship and it was leaving right now and there was only one choice to make, get on it or not. And for me, I had no choice but to get on it. And true to your dedication to your career and your interest in research and publication, 
You then subsequently rose to become the editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Surgery. So can you tell me a little bit about how that came about? Uh, yeah, I mean, how, how do you do that? Well, I suppose that, that interest that I had was from a very, very early age. And every opportunity that I got then during my, my training years, whenever um, I heard of someone who was being asked to be a referee for a paper or, or you know, just being asked to look at a paper to, and to give a, an opinion on it, I, I asked, could I get involved in that? And I said that I'd be delighted to do so. And I, I think from that, then you eventually get to a point where uh, you get actually asked directly by the editors. Um, there's always been an Irish uh, contingent actually involved in, in since the inception. It's over 100 years old, this journal. It's the biggest journal outside North America in the world. It um, is owned by the BGS Society, which is unusual for a journal. And that BGS Society was started by a number of people many of whom are Irish. So over the years, there's really always been. My uh, my predecessor, if you like, in the uh, in terms of Ireland was uh, Ronan O'Connell, who's the current president of RCSI. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure those things have all have a hand to play. Ronan was very kind to ask me to re referee plenty of papers while I was away in the Mayo Clinic. Uh, I now know from the inside mechanics of how this works, that if you do a reasonable job on that, you do, you know, you're scored as a, as a reasonable good referee, Eventually, then we you get invited to be a participant in some way. So I got invited to become an associate editor, then an editor, and then yeah, here I am. Uh, my God, I'm here uh, 15, nearly 16 years later, and now yes, the so-called editor in chief. I hate the title. I don't use it. It's on the banner of the journal, but I never use it in emails or anything. It just means that I'm responsible for the direction which it takes, and I can't begin to tell you how exciting it is, having talked about this rocket ship. That I, you know, enjoyed as a medical student, as as a, as a as a child, so to speak, in, in in medicine and surgery. I can't begin to tell you how cool it is to be kind of Captain Kirk at the front of the of the ship, uh, you know, having some shape in the direction in which it goes. It's wonderful. Well, I really enjoy listening to you today, Des. And finally, I'd like to just ask you, what advice would you give to a medical student who might approach you tomorrow morning and say, Professor Des Winter, I'm interested in a career in surgery. How would you counsel them? Or what advice would you give to them? I think the first thing we probably, the first thing I'd say is, is call me Des, because that's what we do, isn't it, in the modern age? Uh, I would say you, the only negative I'm ever going to say about surgery is you want to make sure that it really is in your veins, that this absolutely drives you, because if it doesn't, uh, you know, they're long and arduous hours and they can be challenging and problematic if you see it only as work. Otherwise, by far the happiest people on earth, the most rewarding specialty the one with the most immediate impact on patient care, the one in which we share parts of the, the body that they don't even get to see. Just imagine that. Imagine that we are, are charged with the responsibility of rearranging parts of anatomy, particularly in my specialty inside the abdomen, where the patient doesn't even get to see what you do. I mean, I can't imagine what's more sacred than that. Their most intimate partner never gets to see or to do anything like that. And therefore, it is quite sacred it is quite uh, uh quite sort of impressive how much faith they place in us and uh, most of the time most of us do the absolute damn best that we can and most of the time the outcome is good and um, there is no better feeling in the world than any of that of course when it goes wrong there's also the downside to that, there's probably, uh, you know, not much worse feeling in the world than that. And it's hard not to feel personally responsible. And that's where colleagues come in. And that's why it's important to have things like the College of Surgeons and to have people around you, colleagues around you who provide you with that level of support and understanding. Uh, and I think we're probably better in today's time than we ever were in the 20 or 30 years that I've been involved. So by far the most job satisfaction of anyone that I've ever met. And I've met some high rolling people. I've met some rock stars. I've met some people who are internationally famous. I've met people who are massive, you know, in Europe who run central banks, who do all sorts of things. None of them I find are anywhere near as happy as any one of us at any one moment in surgery. I can't think of a better thing to do. Thank you so much, Des. It's been a fascinating conversation, and I'm sure any medical student looking to you for advice would be inspired by your energy and your perspective.
Now I'd like to welcome an old friend of mine, Professor Helen Heenahan, consultant bariatric surgeon at St. Vincent's University Hospital in Dublin. So Helen, thank you very much for giving us some time from your very busy clinical schedule. I'd like to start by asking you, why did you decide to become a surgeon? Firstly, thank you, Kevin, for asking me. I'm honoured and um, quite humbled by being asked to speak about, I suppose, my pathway or my, my journey to uh, becoming a surgeon and, and what I do. Um, I remember distinctly the first day I considered a career in surgery was my first day in final med when um, Michael Kern started his first day as the professor of surgery in Galway. And I was interested in surgery the year before as we learned more about the clinical application of um, as, you know, we rotated through the surgery module in Galway. I was an NUIG grad, um, but the passionate energy he brought to teaching and to just every every day, um, the way he, I suppose, demonstrated a love for what he did. I just thought, gosh, I, I, I want some of that. You know, he just really demonstrated a love for the job that he did. And I had met people who enjoyed their jobs, but but not quite anybody with the same energy and uh, enthusiasm, as you well know. So I found that quite inspiring. Um, and everybody seemed to uh, motivate and energize everybody around him uh, in a similar way. Uh, and it just gave me, a, I suppose, it prompted me to learn more about surgery uh, than I probably had done to date. Uh, and then it just, I, I grew real love for it that I hadn't up to that point. Um, the second moment I remember, which uh, confirmed that I wanted a career in surgery was when I was a medical intern in Castle Bar <laughs> and a ward round uh, lasted beyond lunchtime. And I definitely knew that medicine wasn't for me. So <laughs> that, that cemented it. Um, but it was the people I met along the way through surgical rotations as a medical student uh, in my um, fifth and final year, uh, and then as an intern as well. So that sort of lit the fire, so to speak, and then fast track forward to 2022, and now you're a professor of surgery yourself at University College Dublin and St. Vincent's University Hospital. So can you tell me a little bit about how that all happened? Yeah, so I suppose through my surgical training, I developed, as you well know, just a few, you know, I went through surgical training from 2008 uh, till I was appointed as a consultant in 2017. Um, and in that time, we had the so called the dreaded gap years where you had to take time out to earn a higher degree and um, before you were, I suppose, eligible or competitive enough to get on the higher surgical training scheme. And although I, I really dreaded those years because I thought it took away the structure and the organised day that I you know, thrived on as uh, an SHO. Um, and they were formative, like they were the best, well, probably the best three years of my career to, to, to the point of taking on um, uh, a bariatric surgery role. Um, the, I developed a love for academia that I didn't think I, that I was capable of or me that I initially did because I had to do it. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't go into it thinking, want, wanting to do a PhD because I had a real desire to study the molecular expression of breast cancer. But in that time, I found that um, I really enjoyed it. It prompted me to think differently to how I had done previously about disease, surgical diseases and treatments. Um, and I really loved it. And I, I found that I, I not just enjoyed it, but I had an acumen for it. So at that point, I decided I really want to incorporate, I suppose, clinical research, but translational research as part of my long term career. Um, and that led me to, I suppose, look at academic posts. There were none available when I was applying for a consultant post in 2017, just as I finished fellowship training. At that point, I obviously had committed to bariatric surgery. Um, and I was really fortunate to get, uh, you know, the first bariatric surgery role in Ireland um, and, and, and de delighted to do so. But it was a full time clinical role. And in that, I was obviously really happy and, you know, had a had to build up a program that my colleague Justin Gagan had had started and was well established, but had to grow that. And we did. But I suppose the missing piece for me was the time to dedicate to teaching and to research. And I just felt I had a little more to, to give, but also to learn myself um, and the academic component to the chair post. Really, uh, I was really attracted to that. And then the timing was right. The post was available. Uh, I did I did worry I was too young for it. Um, I did worry that I was only two years in a consultant role. And at the time, I did think it was a job perhaps for somebody with more experience. Um, but as soon as I was preparing for it, I realised that actually at my stage in a career, it's, it's a pretty good stage to get on. I have 20 years to achieve all that I want to, to um, you know, develop uh, and um, 
for guests, the research, which my research interest is predominantly around treating obesity, but particularly looking at the impact of treatments of obesity on women's health uh, across many different areas, cancer, particularly breast cancer and endometrial cancer, pelvic floor diseases, and then fetal and maternal health as well. So quite ambitious research programs. UCD um, is really well positioned with other research, with research centres that will help me to do that. So I think, you know, I have an awful lot to do in 20 years and I have I've probably, to some extent, underestimated the task involved. Um, but uh, I am, um, you know, I, I'm delighted I went for it. Um, I was, uh, I suppose, lucky and fortunate to get the post um, and enjoying it. And the other thing is, I, I suppose, I would, as well as surgical training, surgical practice and, and uh, traditional obesity, I love teaching. Um, and this job, I suppose, allowed me to, to do that to a greater extent than I had been able to do as a full time uh, clinical consultant. I know that you provide a lot of mentorship to surgical trainees and you mentioned bariatric surgery as a specialty in Ireland that needs to significantly expand. So in your day to day role as a consultant and as a professor of surgery, how do you mentor medical students and surgical trainees? Um, I think Kevin, by example, I said, you know, um, I think mentorship, it's an interesting, it's not something you set out to, you know, I don't set out every day to just say I'm going to mentor. It's it's something that comes naturally to people when you have shared interests. Uh, and I certainly know the people that mentored me, it was through shared love for, for surgery or for research or teaching. Um, and I think it's in that way. I, I, I find nothing more, um, I suppose, rewarding than a student or a trainee who's interested in surgery overall or but particularly in, in what I do in bariatric surgery. Um, and their interest and willingness to learn spurs me on to mentor them and guide them. Uh, you know, if I can be in any way uh, a role model for them or help them achieve their potential and their desire, then absolutely. Uh, it's only passing on what I have been lucky enough to receive through my training and, and uh, which I still do on a day to day basis from from my mentors. So, you know, it's, it's just, I suppose, by it, it comes as part of the day to day job. I don't see it as a, a job as such to mentor anybody. And I expect that you will have a very significant role to play in training the next group of bariatric upper GI surgeons in Ireland. So can you maybe just explain to me how surgical trainees progress in terms of acquisition of skills within the field of bariatric surgery, given that it is, as you know, a very distinct and technically demanding aspect of surgery in its own right? It is, it is in a way, but I suppose you can distill it down to largely two operations that initially I've, I've had a few people ask me, will, you not, will I not get bored doing just essentially two operations for the rest of my career? But um, they're so different in every single patient that I, I, you know, I've never had, I've never been bored a single day in my career so far. So no, I, I, I can't see that happening. But the way I was, I had two, I undertook two fellowships um, and I got to get um, high volume uh, experience with bariatric surgery, one in the US and one in the UK. And I got very different things from those two training experiences. And I like to think of how, that how I train um, my SBRs now. I have an SBR only for the last three years, um, but I like to think the way I train them is a, is a nice, um, I suppose, mix of the um, uh, you know, the, the strengths of each of the fellowships that I undertook. So, you know, there's a well-defined, I suppose, learning curve with, first of all, advanced laparoscopic skills, particularly with laparoscopic suturing. So, you know, you can break all of our operations down into, you know, 10 steps and the trainees start, you know, I, I have developed, a, I suppose, a program where my trainee, I would expect them to be able to do a sleep gastrectomy or a gastric bypass within six months uh, under my supervision and then be the primary operator on all cases for the last six months of, of a year. So I've achieved that for the last three years. It's going well. And, and I feel that although one year isn't enough um, in a bariatric unit to be able to to, to have the confidence, I suppose, to, to start as a consultant. But a year in a bariatric unit like St. Vincent's, which has pretty high volume at the moment, we're doing, I suppose, you know, over 100 cases a year um, that the trainees can, you know, have access to. But uh, doing 50 cases as a trainee on your own with your supervisor scrubbed or unscrubbed and observing you is what the US fellowships aimed to get. You were ready to be signed off by the fellowship organization once you had done a major part of 50 cases. 
and that even could just be in anastomosis or part of the stapling a first leak gastrectomy and um, so I, I like to think the trainees that come through I suppose uh, the bariatric unit in St Vincent's um, are all uh, are well at that level um, so it's as good as certainly a, a, a training year as what I had in the US and better I think than the year I had in the UK. So it sounds like you will leave your footprint across the country over time with all of these young surgical trainees coming to specialize in bariatric surgery. Can I ask you, Helen, about female participation in surgery as a career? What are your thoughts on ways and means of encouraging female medical students to pursue a career in surgery? Yeah, I suppose in my training, I never saw being female as, as any different. I never found it to be an obstacle. Um, I never felt I was treated any differently than any of my you know, male um, uh, peers going through surgical training. So I never, you know, it's not, um, I think it's really important to have role models. I, I had quite a few, uh, you know, I suppose I came into surgical training at a time where there were more women in surgery. There's still obviously only 10 or 11 percent, but, you know, I admired H. McGovern um, locally. Carmen Malone was in Galway um, when I was, both, you know, the latter stage of, um, or sorry, in my intern and SHO year, um, and Debbie McNamara. Uh, to look up to as well, and Hanley and Vincent's, Ruth Pritchard, you know, so there have been lots of people who I think have been good role models for me. Um, and, and it is, whilst, you know, I know it's, it's important, you know, to, uh, to to see people like you in training. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's certainly in my training in Ireland, I never felt really disadvantaged by being a female. Um, and I think the stereotype really doesn't hold true through train, you know, certainly in Ireland. I have to say I did experience some differences in the UK. Um, I certainly did find, you know, that um, I felt for some of the year I was there on fellowship um, it was different. And, and, you know, perhaps my experience would have been very different if I had trained outside of Ireland. But my US fellowships and, and in Ireland, it was it was not a disadvantage. You know, I never felt these sticky floors or glass ceilings that uh, are spoken about. So I suppose I would just hope that other female medical students and trainees would see that there are no obstacles and that actually, you know, hard work is is the common denominator in succeeding. So if you're willing to work hard, gender doesn't matter. And finally, where do you get all your energy from? How do you manage to sort of keep all of these different aspects of your career all moving along at the same time? Gosh, I suppose I think I could do everything better, Kevin, at the moment. But um, yeah, I've always had, I suppose, uh, it's, 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 I, I love what I do. Um, and I think when you really enjoy work, you, you know, life at home is really interesting and, and good as well. A little girl and you know you have to have energy and uh, um, yeah I suppose I'm surrounded by brilliant people um, and they make things easier uh, both at work at home um, you know and, and you get some of your energy from the people around you who motivate you so yeah it's uh, it's not something I, I think about I suppose everybody would would like more time in their day I certainly would like a lot of extra hours to achieve more but um, yeah, I think being surrounded by good people and having a strong worth ethic is, uh, is one way to get a lot of things done at one time, but uh, there's certainly room for improvement there. So it's very obvious to me that you place great weight on the importance of teamwork and collaboration within surgery, and that you are only really as good or successful as the people around you and other members of the team. Helen, thank you. I've really enjoyed our conversation. And now I would like to introduce you to my colleagues, Catherine and Janelle from the Fellows and Members Office of the RCSI to talk to you about the benefits of being a member of the RCSI. Hello to all of our attendees at today's webinar. And we're delighted that you found the time to listen to our inspirational speakers and special thanks from all of us to the participants. My name is Catherine Jordan, and I'm membership manager in the Fellows and Members Office of RCSI. Our role is to support you on your pathway to surgery. By becoming a fellow member or affiliate member of the college, you gain access to many benefits. Membership also gives you access to an extensive range of training resources and supports, learning and development publications, as well as opportunities to give back through mentorship, and advocacy. My colleague Janelle has worked to bring these resources together on our Moodle portal 
and we'll just give you a brief view of what's available to affiliate members. As you pursue a career in surgery, the Fellows and Members Office is here to support you and we are delighted to launch our new Moodle portal for our affiliate members. We are committed to supporting future surgeons to realise the potential for a career in surgery and their professional development, providing them with resources and support for the MRCSI exams and communicating the value of pursuing a surgical fellowship. Affiliate members of RCSI will have access to RCSI support and information about the pathway to surgery, opportunities to help grow their surgical career and develop their portfolio, including CPG and volunteering opportunities, links to our online LinkedIn community and upcoming events. The portal hosts the latest updates from RCSI's president, as well as the latest affiliate member newsletters, fellows and members publications. RCSI has prepared resources to help affiliates prepare for their MRCS examinations, including access to Surgiquiz. Affiliate members will have the opportunity to improve their surgical skills and scientific knowledge including access to cutting-edge 360 degree videos, surgical anatomy software and guides. It is important that surgical trainees have a clear understanding of pre-operative patient assessment and post-operative care. RCSI has prepared detailed guides covering each of these core areas. We have also provided access to online courses and additional discounts on preparation materials. The Fellows and Members Office is here to support you and we will continue to develop resources for our affiliate members as they edge closer to their goal of becoming a surgeon. Finally, I hope you enjoyed watching this session. I've learned an incredible amount uh, from listening to uh, the trainees and the trainers that I got to interview for this session. In particular, I was really struck by the unbridled passion and enthusiasm that all of the trainees and trainers alike share for the science and the craft of surgery. We learned that as surgeons, we have to be organized and focused and resilient in day-to-day -day clinical practice. Surgical practice involves teamwork and collaboration, and we learned about the importance of working within the multidisciplinary team. We also learned about the importance of excellent uh, communication and presentation skills. Clinical practice involves looking after patients, but it's also important that surgeons are also engaged in the areas of research and teaching. Surgery is an incredibly rewarding career, but sometimes the outcomes of surgical intervention don't always go as expected, and we've got to be able to learn to cope with those disappointments. We learned about the importance of mentorship and the incredible value of mentorship to surgeons and to surgical trainees. Mentorship is such a powerful tool. And allied to that is the importance of the human qualities of kindness and encouragement. As surgeons, we have a duty of care to look after our patients, but I also feel that we have a duty of care to look after each other. And so finally, I would like to encourage any of you who are considering a career in surgery to become an affiliate member of the RCSI and therefore to join our network of fellows and members of the RCSI worldwide.